Hi, I'm Greg Grant, the Smith County Horticulturist for the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Tyler, Texas. Today we're going to talk about earth kind bulbs for Texas in the south and feature most of the bulbs uh, being made available in this year's Smith County Master Gardeners award-winning Bulbs to Bloom conference and sale. I've been in, in love with bulbs for it seems like all my life. The first spring flowering bulb that I fell in love with was a tulip. Uh, I distinctly remember being told in kindergarten that I couldn't put tulips in every picture uh, that I drew, uh, no matter how much I loved them. Uh, I actually wanted to be a tulip farmer one day. Well, that didn't work out as unfortunately tulips uh, aren't really good perennials in Texas. Heck, they're not very good annuals in, in Texas. Uh, quite spectacular, but uh, didn't fulfill my bulb dream like I thought they would. What I did learn to love was bulbs at old home places in Texas. Now, I'm not sure early on if I even thought of these as flowering bulbs uh, like a tulip or if they, for me, they may have been even considered wildflowers. Uh, but nonetheless, they were spectacular blooming plants left over from people that I didn't even know. And so I did fall in love with them. I didn't know what their names were, uh, but I vowed that I would learn one day. So as I became a horticulturist and studied horticulture at, at Texas A&M, uh, I began to study bulbs and learn to identify bulbs, including uh, not only old-fashioned bulbs, but new modern bulbs as well. And I planted as many as I possibly could to find out which ones were truly adapted uh, to Texas in the South. Now, turns out that the ones that were most adapted, of course, were those that what my mentor, Dr. William C. Welch, called time-tested uh, plants. In other words, those plants that have been grown uh, for years and years, for generations and generations, uh, particularly those that you would find in abandoned home places and in cemeteries or where they received no care. And so the plants would tell you over time, uh, you know, one year is nothing. Uh, when you grow a bulb and bloom it the first year, that's because of last year's bulb farmer. But five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, and some of these bulbs I'm gonna talk about today have even been grown for hundreds of years and some of them even thousand uh, years old. And so those are what we call time-tested bulbs, and those are certainly the best because we know that they're proven performers uh, that will hopefully outlive you. Now, what I started doing as part of my career uh, some 30 years ago was planning and testing all the bulbs that were uh, available, including lots of bulbs from, from Holland. Unfortunately, after planting hundreds and hundreds of, of bulbs, only probably a dozen or two turned out to be good, good perennials. So it's really unfortunate and most of the bulbs that we purchase out of catalogs are not very good uh, performers and not long-lived perennials and not good bloomers in Texas in the South. So what I like to grow and the kind of bulbs that uh, we like to offer at this sale and the kind of bulbs uh, that I generally promote and talk about are what I'm gonna call earth kind bulbs. Uh, earth kind bulbs will be those bulbs that are long-lived perennials uh, they don't require chilling. In other words, you don't have to put them in the refrigerator for, for three months to trick them into to growing here. Uh, they don't need irrigation. Matter of fact, the bulbs that work best uh, in Texas and the South work on a wet dry cycle and they need to get bone dry during the summertime. They don't require fertilizer. If you add fertilizer to, to most really proven performers here, you'll end up just fertilizing the weeds and, and the grass. And so no bone meal, no phosphorus, no special bulb fertilizers, no pesticides, no insecticides, uh, no fungicides, uh, no miticides. Uh, they don't need dividing. Uh, there are certainly bulbs that you can grow that you have to keep dividing um, periodically every few years to keep them going. Well, those aren't the kinds that I like to grow and certainly not the kinds that I like to promote. Once I get them in the ground, I like them to stay there and continue blooming for the rest of my life and beyond if possible. Some basics on bulbs, what I call bulbs 101. First of all, bulbs are fleshy storage organs made out of foliage. Uh, they're just plants that, that have learned to adapt uh, to store water and uh, uh, nutrients and carbohydrates underground, uh, sometimes to survive uh, drought or other harsh conditions. Now in horticulture, we refer to a number of, uh, of plants as being bulbous type plants from bulbs. They're not really true bulbs. Those include, include things like tubers and corms and rhizomes and, and tuberous roots. So although they're not true bulbs, uh, we'll refer to them as bulbs, and I'll talk about some of those things today. Uh, bulbs can be divided up into different categories, including annual bulbs, which are bulbs that only live for one year, things like some uh, tulips and caladiums, 
short-lived bulbs, which are, are short-lived perennials, things like some of the larger flowered daffodils, uh, some Dutch high, since most true lilies, a lot of the florist gladiolus. Uh, spring bulbs, when I say spring bulbs, I'm talking about bulbs that bloom during the spring. Summer bulbs, those bulbs that bloom during the summer. Fall bulbs are those that bloom during the fall. So when I was talking about fall bulbs, I'm not, not talking about bulbs that you plant in the fall. Uh, spring bulbs will be bulbs that you plant in the fall. So when I say fall bulbs, I'm talking about those that produce their blooms in the fall. Some terms you'll hear me, hear me use will be naturalizing, which are when bulbs not only return each year as a perennial, but they, they actually produce seed uh, and grow seemingly like wildflowers. So true naturalization is bulbs uh, or species type bulbs that produce seed and slowly seed out. They're usually exceedingly slow, but uh, there are types that will truly naturalize here. Perennialize is a term that I use for those bulbs that return each year as a perennial. The clumps get bigger, they produce more bulbs uh, in each clump, but they don't produce seedlings. Uh, the general characteristics of bulbs will be easy to grow, uh, low maintenance, uh, drought tolerant, uh, light feeders, more expensive than other plants, but certainly much longer lived, and mostly propagated by division. The soil requirements for most bulbs are generally not particular. If they are, I'll try to mention that. Uh, good drainage is best for most of the types. Annual type bulbs, uh, like tulips that we're not going to talk about today, they would require a special uh, potting soil type mix. But we're going to talk about those bulbs that just grow in general, uh, general soil with no additions or amendments whatsoever. Now, if you live in the alkaline parts of Texas, like Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio, the Tezeda narcissus and the heirloom species are more adapted than most of the daffodils and, and jonquils. So if it's yellow flowered, uh, you need to double check to see if it's adapted for you. Uh, whiter flowered Tezeda cluster flowered species are better. And if you are going to grow daffodils and jonquils, you better pick uh, some of the old fashioned early uh, really tough uh, hybrids and species. Narcissus itself, uh, the name comes from Greek mythology, who was the son of uh, Zephyrus and Liriope. Liriope, of course, uh, where our ground cover got its name. They're all members of the Amaryllis family, uh, native to Europe. Uh, I've already mentioned that the terms naturalizing and perennializing. These include uh, plants like daffodils, which are all descend from the species Narcissus pseudonarcissus and the different hybrids and offspring of it that, that look like daffodils. Daffodils are those uh, types of Narcissus that have single flowers, one per stem, uh, a large cup in the middle of the flower, uh, no scent or very little scent, mostly yellow, although there are a few whites, and then wide blue-green foliage. Unfortunately, most daffodils have been bred for show flowers, uh, and the larger the daffodil and the bigger the flower, actually the, the less adapted it is as a true perennial uh, and good performer in Texas and the South. So the really big daffodils uh, tend to return each year as foliage only. And so if you don't dig and divide them every four or five, six years, you're just gonna have foliage for the rest of your life and, and no flowers. So I don't recommend the large, extremely large flowered daffodils, even though they're showy, because they're not good proven bloomers and, and perennial performers for us. So I'm often asked, how many years does it have to perform here for you to say it's adapted to Texas and the South? Well, I'd say at least 20 years and preferably 200 years. Once I get these things in the ground, I want them to bloom every year uh, until I'm dead. And I'm hoping they're gonna continue to bloom long after that. And that's certainly the case with a number of the plants I'll talk about today. Here you see Texas star jonquils blooming at a whole abandoned home place. Uh, the good thing is everything in the amaryllis family has toxic alkaloids in the foliage and the flowers, and it keeps them from being browsed on by cows and, and deer. And so if you have uh, a naturalized planting and you've got to, you're in the country or someplace that have a, has a heavy deer population, uh, narcissus and jonquils and daffodils are, are, are nice because they, they tend to be not only animal browsing proof, but also rodent proof uh, for things like uh, gophers and, and, and voles. Now, I grow a lot of different uh, uh, perennial species of Narcissus and Jonquil and Daffodil, uh, mostly on four different locations. One of them is an acre in front of my parents' house uh, where I've spent, oh, probably 20, 30 years uh, dividing and planting things. Uh, it's a iron ore clay hill, so not the best uh, soil for growing things, so they really have to be tough. Uh, but as you can see, they make quite a, quite a show each year between February and, and March. I also grow a number of heirloom species behind my great-grandparents' house, what we call Big Mama's house. And so I took all the things she had in the yard, 
dig it, dug them, divided them, planted them out in bags so the guys mowing the yard don't have to worry about dodging around the flowers. And so these are all heirloom species. There's Lizzie the Red Terry admiring them one spring. I also grow heirloom um, cultivars and uh, pass along types at my house. Uh, it was my grandparents' house, my great great grandparents' house, so I feel like the old fashioned types fit in better there. And in the fourth place I grow them is a, an old home place I have that I refer to as Miss Lou's. Uh, she originally had one row of jonquils, uh, one row of Texas star jonquil, and one row of butter and eggs daffodil. But I use this to, to plant the more modern uh, types, anything that's perennial. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's heirloom or not. So I dug and divided what she had planted there, but I also try lots of other things. I say trial. I try to only plant those there that are, that are proven performers. So it's about an acre. So each one of them is about an acre in size, and I'm not going to be happy till they're all one foot apart. So I'll spend the rest of my life uh, planting daffodils, jonquils, narcissus, and a number of other spring and fall blooming bulbs. Now when it comes to digging, dividing daffodils and narcissus and jonquils and a lot of other spring blooming bulbs, uh, the best time to do that is when they're completely dormant. Unfortunately, finding your bulbs when they're completely dormant can be tricky. So I've had bulbs that I've had hundreds of and I literally couldn't find them once they've gone dormant. And so people mark them and tag them. Well, then you end up losing your markers and your tags or you've mowed over them or you can't read your tags. And so certainly bulb farmers are going to dig them when they're dormant. And that is the ideal time. But to be quite honest, most of the digging and dividing that I do uh, personally is when the flowers are in full foliage and full bloom. And that way I can tell exactly what I'm planting, what color they are, uh, what variety it is, uh, and if I'm planting on top of something else, which is a problem when you're planting when things are dormant, you don't know what's under the ground until you've already sliced into some bulbs. So typically what I do is I'll try to pick a cloudy, drizzly day, uh, I'll dig a clump of bulbs, I'll pull them apart, I'll put them in a bucket of water, and then I go around planting them. And if you can water them in, that's good. Or if you know a rain's coming or if it's on a drizzly, rainy day, a lot of times they won't even miss the next year's bloom. Uh, certainly the smaller bulbs and the clumps uh, take them a year or so to, to get blooming size again. The worst thing that happens is those that have full blooms on them might miss the next year's bloom and then bloom for the rest of your life. So certainly worth the, the effort. Now, one thing you don't want to do on daffodils and jonquils and narcissus or any uh, spring or fall blooming bulb for that matter. You don't want to braid the foliage uh, or tie up the foliage. A lot of people love the flowers, but they don't like the foliage, particularly uh, as it's starting to flop over and starting to go dormant. And so as long as it's still green and it hadn't turned yellow or brown, you don't want to do anything to the foliage. You need to grow that foliage for next year's bloom. And so every flower on a, on a spring blooming bulb is from last year's foliage. And so when you plant a bulb the first year and bloom it, uh, it's last year's grower that's responsible for that bloom. So you're only responsible for the second year's bloom. And if you tie up those leaves, uh, they can't, can't produce food and nutrients for, for the bulb. And so, so for a bulb to bloom, it has to store up enough nutrients to be a perennial, but even more nutrients to produce a flower the next year. So I often tell people, if I tied your intestines in a knot like this and told you to eat and be healthy, you wouldn't be. And it's the same thing with plants. Every leaf on a plant is a solar panel it needs to be facing the sunlight to store up our carbohydrates to produce energy for that for that plant and for that bulb and that flower. So don't braid them and don't cut off the foliage as long as it's still green. And for the spring blooming types, for me, that's usually Mother's Day or at least Memorial Day if you can. Some of the daffodils that the Smith County Master Gardeners are offering in the sale this year uh, would be Barrett Browning, uh, a fairly old cultivar with white petals and orange flowers, a medium sized daffodil. Uh, quite a proven performer in the south. Interesting with the with the orange cups, not very common in the daffodil world. Bittern, which is a cluster flowered type, uh, could actually belong with the tazettas, the jonquils for that matter, but it has an orange cup and the swept back uh, pale yellow uh, petals. Uh, and you see it's a, it's a fairly recent introduction, so it's uh, something that we identified in my trials as performing well, and you can see how it's multiplied and, and bloomed well each year. So that's bittern. Carlton is perhaps the most popular daffodil in the entire world or the most planted daffodil in the entire world uh, because it's fairly large flowered, uh, traditional yellow, uh, good perennial, uh, probably needs dividing every 10 or 15 years in Texas and the South, but uh, still worth having. Here you see my friend Frank Wagner and his dog Cassie in Jacksonville, Texas. After his wife passed away, he continued to dig and divide her, her daffodils and 
and plant them out in the pasture near the house. And so that's, uh, that's Carlton doing its thing. Um, quite unusual to have a, a fairly large flowered uh, yellow daffodil do well in the south. And so Carlton would be your best choice if you like that look. Ceylon is a fairly modern cultivar that has 30 flowers and, and, and petals uh, bred to be a, a show flower, but actually is a good proven garden performer and perennial as well. Uh, has the orange rimmed cups. And there you see some in, in one of my naturalized planting. So that's Ceylon. Elvin's Voice is a recent uh, introduction uh, that we've added to the sale thanks to my trials. A uh, very classy looking all white daffodil uh, with several flowers per stem. That's Elvin's Voice. February Gold has been around for a number of years now. It's a cyclamenous hybrid that has the swept back uh, yellow petals and the long yellow cup in the middle. Uh, very proven performer in the south. Uh, of course, blooms around February, hence the name February Gold. Ice Follies is fairly unusual because it's a large flower. Uh, I would typically think a flower this size wouldn't be a good perennial in Texas in the south, but it might be the second most planted daffodil in the United States, but also proven performer in the south. I like it because it has these bicolored flowers. They start off with a yellow cup that turns white, and you end up with a combination of both. When you see a large planting of daffodils doing well in the south and you see whites out there, they're almost always uh, Carlton, I mean, excuse me, almost always ice follies uh, with the bicolor yellow and white flowers that eventually turn all white. So that's a planting in Louisiana years ago that featured a number of ice follies with them. Jetfire uh, is a small flowered daffodil that has a long uh, cup that sticks out, kind of a lipstick orange color. Uh, also a cyclamenous hybrid with the swept back petals. Obdum is another one that I wouldn't think that would do well in the south. When I planted it in my trials, it did well each year. Uh, it got better. Uh, and then when I looked it up, it turns out that it's a double flowered sport of ice follies, which explains why it, it does so well. Now, like a lot of double flowered daffodils, they can get kind of heavy if it rains or the wind blows. I make great cut flowers, but sometimes they might get a little floppy, but a spectacular flower, and that's Obdum. St. Kevin is a traditional yellow flowered daffodil, uh, popular uh, throughout the South as being a perennial, so also gives it a traditional uh, daffodil look. Smiling Twin, a fairly recent introduction that has white petals, uh, a yellow split cup on there, gives you a bicolored appearance. I believe it's bred by Brent and Becky in, in Virginia. There you see some in a naturalized planting. Starlight Sensation, another one of those classy white cluster flowered daffodils with the swept back uh, petals uh, and the large cup in the center. A Starlight Sensation, another one we've identified from my trials as being a good performer uh, for Texas. Tahiti is one we introduced as a trial plant last year. Uh, still trying to find out how proven it is as a long term performer, but has spectacular large uh, double flowers of orange and yellow. That's Tahiti. Now the next category we're going to look at are jonquils, and these are plants that descend from Narcissus jonquilla, a native uh, of Spain and France. Uh, small yellow flowers, the species itself is powerfully fragrant, has round foliage, kind of like a bulrush, uh, dark green leaves, uh, mostly known for intense fragrance and small clusters of, of yellow flowers. So the ones that the Master Gardeners have in the sale this year would be Narcissus fernandesii, which looks very much like our naturalized Narcissus jonquilla small clusters of flowers, uh, round leaves, and there you see how well it's performing in my trial plantings. Golden Echo, which is another Brent and Becky hybrid, I believe. Uh, white petals, yellow cup, and uh, very interesting the way the yellow cup bleeds out into the petal, giving it a, a yellow halo behind the cup. So that's Golden Echo. Awara has been around for a number of years. It's one of the, the primrose colored uh, jonquil hybrids. I like it because it gives you a color between white and golden yellow to help tie those plantings together. So that's Hawera. Kedron is very interesting. Uh, this picture really doesn't do it justice because it's a jonquil hybrid that has not only uh, an orangey color to the flowers, but actually has a bronzy uh, color to the flowers. The most, one of the most unique daffodil uh, jonquil uh, flowers I've ever seen. So that's Kedron. Pippet, another unusual bicolor a jonquil hybrid that has white cups, uh, yellow petals, and then the white bleeds out into the, uh, the petals and creating the white halo behind the cup. So it's a, quite a proven performer for us, a mid-season bloomer. So there's Pippet doing its thing spectacularly. 
Sweet Love, another recent hybrid, I believe from Britt and Becky's bulbs in, in Virginia. And you can see it has sort of that salmon colored cup, a uh, very unusual color, uh, Sweet Love. Sweetness itself is a is a uh, almost an heirloom cultivar, been around for a number of years, bred to be a, a sturdy cut flower. I think Scott Agnew calls it an improved Campanelle adjunctal. Has one or two flowers per stem, uh, bright yellow flowers, healthy foliage, multiplies profusely. Uh, it does extremely well and so I tend to plant sweetness at the entrance to most of my drives so I can see them when I'm driving in each year. Uh, very stately jonquil hybrid. You can actually see it's a, a jonquil daffodil cross with the with the blue-green foliage and the miniature uh, daffodil type flowers. Narcissus wilcomii is, is very interesting, something we identified from my, from my trials. It's a miniature jonquil, little bitty flowers, small foliage, short stature, maybe six or twelve inches tall, but extremely uh, prolific, uh, would be great in a rock garden setting or someplace close to a sidewalk or maybe even in containers. And so that's Narcissus wilcomii, a, a miniature jonquil that's done well for me. The last category uh, in the Narcissus uh, genus that we're going to talk about is what we're going to refer to by the common name Narcissus. So anything that descends from Narcissus to Zeta, uh, the hybrids and offspring of it, are what we refer to as Narcissus. A lot of people refer to all of these as paper whites, but paper whites are just one species or one type of, of narcissus. Unfortunately, paper whites only do well from about I-10 south. And so we're going to talk about more cold hardy cultivars. And so narcissus tazetta itself, they bloom in clusters. They're mostly white flowers, have small cups. Uh, most of them have a powerful fragrance, wide, mostly dark green foliage, and tend to be more adapted to alkaline soils than daffodils and jonquil. Uh, the ones that the Smith County Master Gardeners have available this year are Bridal Crown, which is a double flowered uh, Narcissus uh, with the combination of the um, uh, orangey yellow and the white petals, uh, nice fragrance. Falconet, which is one of a number of, of the yellow uh, hybrid Narcissus that could actually belong in the uh, jonquil category as well. They're really kind of half jonquil, half Narcissus. So that's Falconet with the orange cups and the yellow petals. Geranium is an older one that has orange cups and white petals um, amid the late season bloomer. Sir Winston Churchill, uh, another double flowered but a late bloomer. It's really unusual to have late bloomers that do well because in, um, in the daffodil, jonquil, narcissus world, you can be an early bloomer, early mid-season, mid-season, mid-late, late, or, or very late. And so to have a late bloomer is unusual because most of the proven performers in Texas and the rest of the South, for that matter, uh, tend to be early bloomers and, and early mid-season bloomers. So Sir Winston Churchill is a favorite of our uh, bulb loving master gardener, Ann Patello, and also uh, my mentor, Dr. Uh, Welch, loves Sir Winston Churchill. Beautiful flowers. Thalia is an older hybrid, uh, very uh, exquisite looking with the pure white flowers and the spidery petals. So that's Thalia, uh, a nice perennial narcissus. Now we're going to talk about some other spring blooming bulbs, uh, and there are a number of others that, that do well. Uh, this is actually a, a culinary uh, bulb, multiplying onions or, or gumbo onions. Um, my wife is a, is a Cajun, and so she can't live uh, without green onions to, to put in almost everything she cooks. And so there are perennial onions that we can grow in the south. We plant them in the fall, they grow foliage during the winter time, you harvest the, the foliage is needed, and they go dormant during the summer just like the jonquils and the daffodils and the narcissus. Then you dig them up, uh, keep them in a basket or bucket during the summertime, pull them apart, plant the best looking ones out, share the others with somebody else. And um, you can leave them in the ground, but sometimes they'll rot during the summer and actually the, the foliage gets smaller as the bulbs multiply and get too thick in there. So it does like to be divided and shared. And so these are multiplying onions or, or gumbo onions that we have available. African hosta, uh, not a hosta, but a, a very unusual perennial bulb uh, that's rarely offered in the tray. Beautiful spotted foliage, uh, fairly attractive flowers for shady situations. So that's the African hosta. Byzantine gladiolus, one of my favorite perennial gladiolus and one of the only long-term perennial gladiolus for Texas in the South. I started with five corms as a kid and eventually built up a block of 10,000. So they multiply well, uh, very good investment. Uh, one corm will multiply into multiple corms through little cormlets, and then eventually you'll have nice pretty clumps and you can take and divide those clumps like I did 
eventually have more and more. So a screaming magenta colored flower. But be aware if you see in this picture that little bitty flowered uh, gladiolus to the right that's pale is what most Dutch bulb companies, almost all Dutch bulb companies offer is Byzantine gladiolus. So the large flowered bright magenta thing is, is the true heirloom in Texas and the South, rarely available in the trade. Uh, we never have enough each year, and so we try to offer some of those in the sale. Uh, the little flower thing is what you see in catalogs, uh, which generally just makes a bunch of foliage, a few flowers, and flops around on the ground. So be really careful if you purchase cheap uh, imposter Byzantine gladiolus because they're often incorrectly named. Another one of my really favorite uh, flowers is the old uh, Hippiastrum johnsonii, the, the St. Joseph's lily. Uh, the first hybrid amaryllis in the world from 1799 and still the best proven amaryllis performer in the south. Uh, rarely, rarely available in the trade, uh, not grown in, in Holland, so it, it takes uh, uh, some specialty growers to produce it, but it's the longest lived, uh, easiest to grow, uh, most cold hardy amaryllis that we can grow, the St. Joseph's lily. Spanish bluebells are what most gardeners refer to as wood hyacinths. We have uh, two different uh, cultivars available, uh, Excelsior, the blue flowered, flowered form. These aren't true hyacinths, but they look like hyacinths. They grow in shaded situations and in good drainage. You see them performing in an Akadoches garden. And then we also have the white flowered form uh, of Spanish bluebells or wood hyacinths available too. Uh, another really easy to grow spring flower would be spring star flower. This is Ipion uniflorum. Uh, has foliage that smells like garlic and flowers that smell like freesias. So you don't want to roll in it or step on it when you're smelling them. Uh, but spectacular performer. Uh, what the Smith County Master Gardeners offer is Wisley Blue, which is a medium blue. Uh, it truly uh, naturalizes and spreads by seed if you let it. In addition to coming back uh, as a perennial from the little bulbs, uh, can be grown in lawns, flower beds, pots, um, borders, very easy to grow. So that's spring star flower. And the Master Gardeners came into a collection of, of named bearded German iris several years ago from a collector and an iris society member. And so there will be a number of named cultivars. And so those will be spelled out uh, on the order forms. And so uh, true named uh, showy bearded German iris are available in the sale. Uh, some really proven performers for not only alkaline soil, but acid soil, sun, shade, wet, dry would be summer snowflakes or leucogium. We have both the traditional species uh, and also the cultivar grave tie giant available. Little white bell shaped flowers early in the springtime. Grave tie giant has larger flowers, blooms a few weeks later, has a little bit more glaucous foliage to it. So both of them worth having because it extends your season and gives you a little bit different look. So two forms of summer snowflakes, which ironically they bloom in the spring, not the summer. And here you see some naturalized at my place. I started with one clump of bulbs as a kid, and I have produced thousands and thousands and thousands by dividing over the years. And then each clump just gets bigger and bigger, uh, never has to be divided, but if you want to divide it to produce more, quite easy to do so. And that's Acer taking a look at them last year. Another interesting bulb that's rarely available in the trade that uh, the Master Gardeners have in the sale this year is the hardy white Gloxinia, uh, long tube, uh, tubular flowers that uh, dangle from stems. Uh, in late springtime with the silvery gray foliage. So that's the hardy white, white Gloxini. Extremely easy to grow, uh, multiplies profusely. We've got a, a collection of species tulips. I mentioned tulips don't do well in Texas and the South, but there are a few that are pretty good performers. If you have good drainage, uh, full sun, more, more rock garden sort of specimens, smaller flowered types, mostly all of this descending from uh, Tulip Ecclusiana. And so if you want to try some Species tulips are number uh, four or five, I think, available in the sale this year. Just make sure you can give them full sun and good drainage. Some other spring blooming uh, plants, um, excuse me, summer blooming plants that are in the sale uh, would be the heirloom orchid pansy or achimenes. And most of the achimenes that are offered in catalogs are not good perennials uh, for Texas in the South. The old purple one is the same one my piano teacher. Uh, Miss Yancey had in Longview when I was a kid. They're good for container plants, also decent uh, as, as bedding plants, uh, a little more cold hardy than we typically thought, and can also tolerate a little more sun than we thought. But typically, they've been grown in shade uh, as container plants. And so you can actually let them go dormant 
dormant in the fall and pull the pots in the garage or a shed and put them back out the next year. Or you can actually take up the little, um, I think they're actually rhizomes. Uh, and so they're, they're very brittle. They look like little purple or pink pine cones. And so you can store those in, in a sack or a, a bag of potting soil on the shelf, or you can store the whole plant and then divide them when you plant them out each spring. Or you can leave them in the pots or the, or the ground and let them return. Uh, not super cold hardy, uh, so it's always best to take some in to save them. And so the, those are Achimenes or orchid pansies. Another very interesting bulb we have uh, for sale, thanks to Keith Hansen, who also grows our Achimenes. Keith's the former county horticulturist in Smith County, was there for a quarter of a century. Uh, we'll also have voodoo lilies or a Morphophallus bulbifer. Uh, very interesting foliage, almost looks like a little um, prehistoric palm tree growing in your garden and it makes the little bulbils on top of that, that plant in addition to a large bulb under the ground. So I think we have bulbils available this year in the sale. Uh, a couple of different crinums this year. One of them is Crinum baconia, which is one of the milk and wine lilies. I got this uh, particular strain years ago from Tai Tao uh, bulbs in Georgia. Uh, probably 30 or 40 years ago. And so I've dug some of those from the sale. Uh, bright uh, uh, magenta pink buds that open to striped flowers with the maroon stripe down the middle of the flower. So that's crown and baconia. And then uh, one of the unusual crowns we'll have on the sale this year is Claude Davis. Claude Davis was a member of the American Amaryllis Society and uh, quite the Amaryllis and uh, crown expert from Baton Rouge. And so I'm digging a clump of those. It's a medium pink flower, trumpet sized flower uh, on, a, of course, a long lib uh, bulb that, that blooms every year for the rest of your life and, and then some. So that's Crinum Claude Davis, a nice pink. We'll also have Montbrecia in the sale, a little corm related to gladiolas. Uh, they're like little miniature orange gladiolas. Here you see uh, some growing in my perennial border years ago. Uh, it's just an easy, easy to grow, uh, prolifically multiplying. Uh, orange corn from, from South Africa. Now, unfortunately, most of the uh, Crocosmia or Montbrecia around the world don't grow here. So only the first hybrid one uh, is extremely proven performer. So that's the orange uh, Montbrecia. We have the hidden ginger uh, available in the sale again this year. Big bold foliage and the beautiful uh, pink and white and yellow flowers that are kind of hidden under the foliage. Some people actually go through and cut back the foliage so they can see the flowers, make spectacular cut flowers. So that's uh, the hidden ginger. Uh, does best in um, uh, partial shade and, and good drainage. Thanks to Keith, we have a very interesting uh, Gloxinia this year, a hardy Gloxinia called Devita, bright red orange flowers, very unusual, uh, very uncommon. You'll never see it in the trade, only from a few specialty uh, mail order perennial and, and bulb companies. So thank you, Keith, for the Evita hardy, hardy Gloxinia. Uh, partial shade and good drainage for this, or even a container plant. Uh, once again, we'll have the heirloom Hedicium coronarium, the butterfly ginger, which is named not because it attracts butterflies, because the flowers are shaped like butterflies. Intoxicating fragrance, it smells like the tropics or, or Hawaii. Easy to grow, uh, does best in moist soil and sun, but it will also take uh, any soil in, in partial shade. Here you see a spectacular planting in, in Nacogdoches, Texas, perfume in the entire garden. So that's Hedicium coronarium, the white butterfly ginger. Another beautiful white flower that, that this fragrant is Hymenocallis carabia tropical giant. It's the summer blooming uh, spider lily that you'll see in gardens across the south, also not available uh, commonly in the nursery trade. Big bold uh, green foliage and white fragrant flowers around July 4th each year. Long lived perennial, easy to grow, full sun, sun or partial shade. This year I'm digging uh, a really spectacular Louisiana iris to have in the sale, one called Red Velvet Elvis. Uh, spectacular flowers, vigorous plant. Um, Louisiana iris can tolerate moist soil or they can tolerate just regular garden soil. Grow their foliage during the late winter and early spring, bloom in the springtime, and go somewhat dormant during the summertime. So there's red velvet Elvis Louisiana iris. We'll also have some Lilium formosanum, the Philippine lily, in the sale. Uh, not sure how many bulbs we'll have. It's a little difficult to, to dig, but they're one of the few true lilies that not only uh, acts as a good proven perennial in the south, blooms in the middle of the summertime, grows in sun or shade, shorter plants in the sun, taller plants in the shade, but also produces seed and naturalizes. So here you see a stand behind my house, a spectacular lilies blooming uh, during the hot part of the summer. 
because they're pollinated by moths at night with their fragrant flowers. Just a spectacular, easy to grow, true lily, the Philippine lily. Some of the fall blooming bulbs that we have in the sale. I love fall blooming bulbs because uh, they pop up after a harsh summertime when you think you're never gonna be able to garden again, everything's dying, the grass turns brown, and you think, oh my gosh, why did I pick this as a hobby? Then you get some rains as school starts in the fall, and voila, things start to grow. And so some of the fall blooms, as fall bulbs that we'll have in the sale this year would be the hardy cyclamen, cyclamen heterofolium, big tuber under the ground that makes these little miniature cyclamen flowers uh, in the fall, uh, early spring, sometimes even late summer, but makes this beautiful foliage that looks a lot like English ivy where it gets the species name heterofolium. We have several rain lilies in the sale this year, including Hambranthus robustus, the pink rain lily. It's a prolific, heavy bloomer, large flowers, uh, sets a lot of seed, naturalizes quite nicely. Uh, Dr. Welch has spectacular plantings of this in his garden, and we grow a number of them uh, at the Tyler Botanical Garden. So that's Hebranthus robustus, a really easy to grow uh, rain lily. We'll have a few Texas uh, copper lilies, Hebranthus tubospathus texensis, one of our true East Texas natives with the small uh, golden copper uh, colored flowers. There you see them naturalized in front of my parents' house. And then we'll have some Zephyrinthes candida, the, the white rain lily, which can tolerate mud or regular garden soil. Uh, it's nice, attractive foliage and white flowers in the late summer and fall. We'll have a number of unusual spider lilies or Lycoris available in the sale this year, uh, depending on how many I get dug. One of them is Lycoris alba flora, traditionally called the white spider lily. There are no, uh, well, there are very few true white spider lilies. They usually come in different combinations of peaches and corals and creams and, and pale yellows and then fade to white. This is one of the most spectacular that has reflexed petals and ruffled petals. Uh, starts off with peachy com combinations, particularly in the springtime, um, excuse me, in the cooler weather of fall, uh, and then fades to almost white. So that's um, Lycoris alba flora that we'll have available this year. They have the same growth cycle Lycoris does as our spring booming Narcissus and jonquils and daffodils, they make their foliage in the wintertime, go dormant during the summertime, but then they produce their flowers at the beginning of the growing season as opposed to the end of the growing season like the daffodils and the narcissus and jonquils. Spectacular cut flowers, long-lived perennials, uh, like good drainage, and it have to have winter sunlight. So they can tolerate shade of deciduous trees. Uh, I mostly grow them in the full sun, but they can to to tolerate deciduous shade. We'll have Lycoris radiata radiata, the, the old-fashioned uh, triploid heirloom red spider lily, uh, the kind that uh, is tough enough to even grow in Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio. Uh, generally, generally bloom about September each year. Here they are in front of the house where my mom was born, just a long-lived uh, perennial that's been performing here for several hundred years uh, and for thousand plus years before that in, in Asia. A very unusual spider lily we'll have available this year is, is what used to be known as Lycoris haywardii, uh, now known as Lycoris rosea, the pink spider lily, because of the, uh, it's actually a cross between um, the red spider lily uh, and uh, Lycoris springeri, which gives it those, those uh, very unusual um, blue tips to the, to the petals. And so that's Lycoris haywardii that I've been trying to build up numbers for, for years. Not a whole lot of them in the sale, um, but enough that for a number of you get a chance to, to grow in your garden. We'll have once again Lycoris incarnata. Didn't have a very good crop this year, but we've got some more of the peppermint spider lily. One of my favorites does extremely well. Uh, white flowers with the pink stripes down the center, almost like little um, milk and wine lilies. So that's the peppermint spider lily. We'll have some Lycoris squamidra, the great big uh, naked lady or surprise lily or resurrection lily. Uh, needs a little bit of chilling, so tends to do better from, from I-20 north, although um, I generally get a, a good bloom each year uh, in deep east Texas. You see what spectacular flowers they have. Also probably have Lycoris, um, oh, a spring eye in the, in the parentage, which sometimes gives you those little blue tips to the petals, but probably the largest of all the, uh, uh, the fall bloom and spider lily. I say fall bloom and Lycoris scomedra generally starts to bloom about August one of the earliest of all the bloomers. Once again, we'll have oxblood lilies available. No better proven performer for Texas, whether you be alkaline soils or acid soils. Um, most common around central Texas, but proven performer all across the southeast. Blood red flowers about the time school starts each year. I started with three bulbs 
when I was in college and went on to produce a block of 10,000 and then dig and divide and naturalize them over all my properties and love, love, love red spider lilies. I can't have enough in my opinion. We'll also have some of the very rare pink oxblood lilies, which has taken me years and years to build up numbers after growing out an initial crop of seed. Uh, because they're seedlings, they can be different uh, shades of pink. And so it's fun to see the different colors everywhere from, from light pink to, to magenta pink uh, to, to reddish pink. And once in the blue moon, uh, you'll want to look for even a white seedling out there. So they can actually naturalize, although it's be it very slowly. The reds produce very little seed. The pink, pink produce a number of seed. Probably best to grow them in, in a pot or a flat uh, if you want to grow out a crop of seeds. It takes a long time to get them to bloom from seeds, but they certainly are spectacular. I have one whole acre that I'm trying to naturalize in pink oxblood lilies. This year, our, our special raffle bulb is going to be crying on Mrs. James Henry. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Uh, William C. Welch, this is his very favorite crinum, spectacular um, uh, flowers that are blush colored. Uh, they start off with pink buds, fade to almost white. They smell heavenly, like a combination of uh, Fruit Loops and perfume. Uh, has some of the more attractive of the crinum foliage. So to Dr. Welch, it's the only crinum that should have ever existed. And so uh, not very common in, in the trade at all. And so I've dug some to, to, to move and we will have uh, a nice blooming size bulb. Uh, Mrs. James Henry is our raffle bulb this year. Some seed that we have available in the sale uh, again this year, one of them that I introduced is the uh, Grant's Garnet um, Poppy. It's actually a uh, Laciniatum type with the, the very double flowers, thanks to Keith Hansen producing the seed for us. And so that's the Aggie Poppy you plant these. In the fall, about September, October, same time you would larkspur and blue bonnet seed. They grow through the winter time. I thin them out to about one every six inch, every six inch, or, no, or maybe one every foot. Uh, so they'll have nice, large flowers and big plants. They bloom in the springtime, and then set their seed. Then you can save the seed to plant out again next year on bare soil and full sun. So there you see some of my early uh, Aggie poppies, along with Byzantine gladiolus. We'll also have Cleo's purple coneflower once again. Uh, this is a purple coneflower that I got from the late Cleo Barnwell of Shreveport, Louisiana years ago. It's the most um, adapted, perennial, reseeding, easy to grow purple coneflower echinacea that you could possibly grow. Here you see some in the Heritage Rose Garden at the Tyler Botanical Garden that I literally planted from seed. And just by scattering seed, you can see what a spectacular show they made. So that's Cleo's purple coneflower. We'll have seed available of that. Some of the plants that are available this year in the sale, uh, some woody plants would be the Autumn Blaze Red Maple, actually a hybrid between the uh, Silver Maple and the Red Maple, gives us dependable uh, red fall color every year uh, in the south, that's Autumn Blaze. Merlot Red Bud, which is an improved uh, purple leaf red bud, pink flowers, and burgundy foliage, that's Merlot. Uh, the Golden Rain Tree, spectacular uh, yellow flowers each summer. Colriteria Paniculata will have uh, one of the superstar uh, Vitek selections, uh, Show Creek, um, the Chase Tree, long blue spikes of flowers during the summertime. If you want to shear it, you can get repeat bloom on there. I actually cut mine to the ground each year and grow them as, as shrubs, much like uh, people do their relatives, the butterfly bush. So that's Show Creek Vitex, uh, great for bees and, and butterflies. Fashion's Party Pink Crepe Myrtle is another Texas superstar. Uh, it was the first hybrid crepe myrtle in the world. Uh, came from Bill Basham's backyard in Houston, Texas. It's a large growing crepe myrtle. We're looking at maybe 30 feet tall. So if you need a shade tree like we did in my backyard, my wife wanted a, some shade and she likes crepe myrtles. And so I planted a Basham's party pink that'll shade my little backyard so she and the, uh, the cats can sit in the shade of a, a, of a pretty crepe myrtle. It's also one of the longest blooming crepe myrtles there is and mildew resistant and a Texas superstar. So that's Basham's party pink. Also, because a lot of people don't have room for large tree-type crepe myrtles and tend to butcher them all the time, we've selected some of the semi-dwarf crepe myrtles for people that don't want a big crepe myrtle and don't have to top them each year. So one of those is Pink Velour, which is known for its uh, purple burgundy foliage in the springtime, and then uh, the uh, fuchsia pink flowers during the summertime. Also Royalty, uh, one of the older purple types, but a, a semi-dwarf type. So if you want a small tree uh, with purple flowers, Royalty is a, is a very proven performer. Speaking of large trees, we've got some Montezuma cypress in the sale, which is native to South Texas and Mexico, but does well across 
uh, Texas in the south. It's, it's actually tolerant of alkaline soils. It doesn't produce knees. It's more open shape than the traditional bald cypress. Here, here you see Dr. Welch standing under one that was planted at the antique rose emporium when I was in college. So those huge trees right there were planted in the 1980s, believe it or not. And so one of the largest trees on the earth is actually a Montezuma cypress in, in Mexico. So if you got room uh, for a large bald cypress that almost wants to be evergreen, uh, you can plant you a, a Montezuma cypress uh, and not have to worry about knees popping up or not have to worry about iron chlorosis on alkaline soils. Uh, one of my favorite peaches that we have in the sale this year is Belle of Georgia, which is a white flesh peach. Uh, one year I produced enough of my tree to actually sell peaches off of it. And so an, an heirloom peach uh, with white flesh, a um, little bit easier to grow than some of the more modern hybrids, but still needs a, a spray schedule to, to do well. Uh, we have a Texas Superstar Blackberry uh, this year available called Natchez. Uh, I used to have them growing on my, on my back fence, and I think I'm going to plant them on my uh, fence again because my, my Cajun wife loves her blackberries. And so Natchez is thornless and extremely heavy producer. Uh, we'll have uh, some sugar figs or Celeste figs in the sale. Uh, this is an old-timey fig, actually the same fig that my grandmother made fig preserves out of this year. So I've got the fig tree that has uh, uh, been there for my entire life. Heck, it may have been there before my grandmother lived there, so it's probably close to 100 years old. Uh, the sweetest, best taste in figs of all, in my opinion, Celeste, and one of the most cold-hearted. Now, I do like to, to write, and so if you suffer from insomnia and want to read more things, I've, I've written several books, including uh, Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, Heirloom Gardening in the South, and the Rose Rustlers with, uh, with Dr. Welch. I write a blog each month at arborgate.com. Uh, I write each issue of uh, Texas Gardener Magazine. I write a Sunday column in the Tyler uh, Morning Telegraph, a Sunday Garden column, and I usually repost that on my uh, Facebook page. And so Greg Grant Garden's Facebook page will generally get you a, a reposting of my blogs and my uh, uh, garden column, along with other tidbits that I like to post. Uh, the Master Gardeners are selling uh, three of my books in the sale. So if you like an autographed book, we've got Heirloom Gardening in the South, Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, and the Rose Rustlers uh, that I wrote with Dr. Wells. So all of those are available in the sale. Actually, what we have available in the sale is the, the brand new second edition of Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. So we've added some new plants to that and some new recipes. So it's got uh, some of my recipes, some of my mom's recipes, and some of my Cajun wife's uh, recipes in the back as well. And so that's Texas Fruit and Vegetable Garden second edition, uh, brand new this year. If you want books uh, to, to learn about bulbs, although we're not selling these at the sale and some of these might be out of print, they're well worth finding. Uh, the best bulb book for the South is Garden Bulbs for the South, second edition by friend Scott Ogden. Uh, you'll certainly want that in your library. Daffodils in Florida, a field guide to the coastal south by uh, coastal south by Linda Van Beck and, and friend Sarah Van Beck. Uh, extremely good uh, for daffodils and, and jonquils and narcissus and how to grow those uh, in East Texas uh, and all the Southeast for, for that matter. Um, they're actually in, uh, in Tallahassee, which is very similar to the eastern part of Texas and the whole southeast. Uh, one that's out of print but worth having is Bulbs for Warm Climates by the late Thad Howard, a retired veterinarian and one of the best bulb experts we ever had in Texas. And of course, we've got Chris uh, Weisinger and Dr. Welch is the Bulb Hunter. Uh, Chris Weisinger has the Southern Bulb Company, so that's a wonderful book that, that he wrote. Uh, if you want sources for, for southern bulbs, maybe things you couldn't get in the sale or want to see what else does well in the south, there's jinxfarmer.com. Uh, friends, Jinx, Jinx Farmer grows uh, crinums in South Carolina. Oldhousegardens.com. They're actually in Michigan, but they sell not only northern adapted bulbs, but southern bulbs, including those grown in the south. Plantdelights.com. That's Tony Avent in North Carolina. has crinums and uh, unusual lycoris and all sorts of good perennials that are adapted to the south. And then southernbulbs.com, that's Chris Weisinger's bulb uh, company here in East Texas. And so you can check them out on their website. And certainly they have proven uh, bulbs for Texas in the south as well. I want to thank a number of people uh, for our annual sale. First of all, Ed McGee, um, Smith County Master Gardener extraordinaire. He was the founder of this sale almost a quarter of a century years ago, a quarter of a century ago. And uh, just to show you how long in the tooth I'm getting, I grew bulbs for that first sale. And so thank you, Ed McGee, uh, for starting this sale. It's been a, been a wonderful thing. Helped a lot of people get great bulbs and educated numerous people uh, on true uh, 
long live perennial bulb for the south. I want to thank the Smith County Master Gardeners for putting on the sale each year, uh, for pulling off the sale, thousands of hours of work and thousands of dollars going to uh, putting on the sale. It's our main fundraiser uh, to be able to participate in all our educational activities each year. I want to thank Keith Hansen, the retired Smith County Horticulturist, for helping out with PR and providing bulbs and seeds for the sale each year. I want to thank friend, uh, thank friend Neil Sperry uh, for PR and helping promote our sale each year. I want to thank the Pollard United Methodist Church uh, facility uh, for allowing us a place for bulb pickup this year. Uh, since for the second year in a row, we've had to do the bulb uh, sale virtually uh, with online sales and in-person pickup. And then I want to thank Texas Gardener Magazine friend Jay White uh, for helping with PR as well. Now, when you come to visit Tyler to pick up your bulbs, you'll want to make sure and visit the Tyler Botanical Garden uh, maintained uh, by the Smith County Master Gardeners. That's where uh, most of the fundraising money ends up being spent uh, is developing these gardens. It's located at the Tyler Rose Garden in Tyler, Texas. And so the Tyler Botanical Garden includes the Heritage Rose Garden, the Shade Garden, which has a wonderful collection of, of maples and uh, camellias and uh, azaleas, and then the Idea Garden, which is a spectacular color garden. And so all three of these gardens are part of the Tyler Botanical Garden, all of them designed, funded, and maintained by the Smith County Master Gardener. That's the end of my talk. Uh, if you want more information, visit the Smith County Master Gardener Facebook page, visit the Smith County Master Gardener website. You can also visit uh, my Facebook page at Greg Grant Gardens. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed the information that I've provided and hopefully uh, you'll participate in the sale. And if not, hope you learned something uh, about maintaining and looking after and propagating your own bulbs. I love bulbs, I hope you love them too. And I want you to plant lots of them. Thank you, it's been Greg Grant. Uh, Texas Anti-Magalife Extension Service, uh, Smith County and Tyler, Texas.